All right. Welcome, everyone. This is David Morgan, and we have a guest that was actually brought to me through uh, all that we've been doing in the Crypto Conspiracy Series. And this friend of mine said, you've got to hear Joshua Shigala about central bank digital currencies. But before we get to that, Joshua, give us a background. You have quite an extensive background, and it also ties into the precious metals. So let's hear it. <laughs> yeah, it sure does. I, I'm an old gold silver bug from way back. Uh, uh, back when uh, Bitcoin didn't exist and uh, we were listening to you guys and, and Peter Schiff and all those guys uh, to, to stack silver and um, and uh, they, they were good old days and that, that really came from the 9-11 because of 9-11 it really gave that interest in follow the money you know <laughs> I didn't quite I, it didn't quite sit well this whole just religious fanaticism uh, I thought there's got to be some money involved here, and and really it led down that path of central banking and and all of that. But uh, yeah, I've, I've been in in Bitcoin since 2010, um, late 2010, and uh, this was purely because I've I've been fascinated with alternative currencies since since uh, you know seeing the twin towers fall, and I wanted to build a different system, so I, I started building sites where people could just swap stuff and and barter. Uh, online and um, uh, rather than buying and selling but I've soon realized that that's a terrible mechanism for any sort of larger marketplace um, because hey I really love that jacket of yours David but uh, you don't like anything I have and rather than me just giving you something um, to, that you could use in the entire marketplace the deal falls through so it's it's a it's a massive friction and uh, this, this is fairly obvious obviously but when you're a younger uh you know full of dreams of uh changing the world you think oh yeah <laughs> let's try this and uh that led me down the path of trying to find a different mechanism to put into the website that i could have a digital some sort of credit system or you know i didn't call it tokens back then but some sort of system but then i soon realized then i would be the central bank and then it would go full 360 so i was already looking for what the cypherpunks were working on which was the the prelude to Bitcoin. So this little mailing list was looking at different ways of creating a digital currency that didn't have a central bank, didn't have a central authority and using encryption. And uh, the, the major problem was a computer science problem that they've been struggling with for a very long time, which is called the double spend problem. Meaning if I have an MP3 and I send it to you, how do you know that I haven't kept the copy? <laughs> You know, I, I could double spend that MP3, you know, or triple or infinitely spend it. And so with a digital digital thing, that, that's really what Satoshi solved, is taking all the bits and pieces that the cypherpunks were working on and, and made it uh, very cohesive to say, now we have a digital good that cannot be copied, and there's a finite amount of them, so a rare digital asset. And, uh, and so... I, I actually thought that it was an unsolvable problem and I went away, but I kept my ear to the train track, so to speak. And I, I, I just sort of kept kept watching. And yeah, then the white paper came across my table in 2010 and I've been falling down that rabbit hole ever since. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and you know, I've, I've run an exchange since 2015. I actually, after the very first Bitcoin exchange exploded, similar to what X, FBX, uh, FTX happened, uh, this was called Mt. Gox. This was the first exchange. And um and it really uh it really inspired me to create the ultimate transparency protocol uh for bitcoin exchanges and um and so i created the, an, a protocol called the glass books protocol with my brother and uh we we shopped that around to different exchanges no one wanted to touch it <laughs> i soon realized that these centralized exchanges were were playing the same old game that bankers have played since since the gold days uh when people would trade their silver for gold uh, for, for silver certificates and uh and go to the markets with that and uh, and be rehypothecated so so really um we then built our own exchange uh to launch it as kind of a showcase to say look this is infinitely transparent anyone can see and uh yeah and now i i've the last two years i've been working on a stable the ultimate stablecoin protocol because i realized that for us, uh, the threat of CBDCs that are coming, we really need an alternative, an exit door that people can take to say, look, these are coming and, and I don't want it. I don't want to have anything to do with it. Or you'll force me to use it, but 
there's an exit door that I can use it if if you guys put too much friction uh, into that, and we'll we'll I guess we'll talk about that. So we that, that's kind of my background. Yeah. Okay, uh, not much to add. I just have to kind of throw in this little color. Uh, one of my members, been a member for quite some time wrote me a few years ago he said uh i had and i won't say the amount but it was a pretty good m amount of bitcoin on mount gox and i lost it all i'm not yeah. so greedy anymore i just want to preserve what i have and it's kind of what i do and teach um sad story you know i mean like you said kind of a precursor to the ftx debacle but <clears throat> moving on so let's hear you know, I've got my own thoughts on CBDCs, but you're here. I want to interview you. I want to hear what you have to say. And I may interrupt you. I'll just try to pause you now and again, but I really don't want to stop your flow. So just turn on the faucet. And let's hear about what you think about CBDCs. Well, thank you, David. And I, I'd have actually love to hear what you have to say about it as well. Um, you know, you've been such a thought leader in this space for such a long time, and, and it's an absolute honor to be on your show, actually. Um, yeah, so CBDCs, you know, a lot of people say, well, what's the difference? You know, we've already got digital cash. I use my credit card. We use online banking. Everything's digital mostly, apart from the bit of, you know, cash that I use here and there to buy gum at the servo. Like it, it's, but the real difference is that right now you have an account at the bank and that a bank, that bank has a contract with you to keep your privacy. Now, the government needs to go through a whole lot of steps, hopefully, <laughs> supposedly, <laughs> um, to, to, to find out what you're doing and put a stop to it. Like they, they, you have to get a subpoena and you know, go through courts. There, there's some checks and balances in, in the perfect world that, that needs to happen. Now, right now, uh, I'll, I'll take the UK, for instance. Uh, there are about 300 plus banks in the UK. And, uh, and if I send money from bank A to bank B, um, that bank doesn't get it instantly. We all know that. It's just uh, what happens at the end of the day is everything that got sent from this bank to this bank uh, goes to the central bank and they say, okay, we have a million from this bank sent to this bank and 200,000 from this bank to this bank. So let's not send every transaction. Let's just send 800,000. Let's just split the, the difference and send 800,000 and it's cleared. So it's one transaction rather than a whole heap. And, and it's done. Now, the great thing about that is that the central bank doesn't know what made up that million. Uh, you know, it, it can be hundreds of transactions and, and they don't know the details. All they know is, okay, there's one transaction, A100K needs to go there and then it's all settled for the day. Now, the CBDC or something like Fed now, which the, the American Fed is saying, this isn't a CBDC, this is just instant settlement. It's effectively the same thing. Because what they're doing is saying that now the accounts are at the central bank. And if you decide to um, do a trade, what's happening is your trade goes directly to the central bank with the other. It's an instant settlement. Now, we all know that the road to hell is paved with convenience. And, and this is this facade of convenience that they're portraying as saying, oh, it's going to be so convenient. People will get instantly paid. Um, but, but, the caveat are you're losing this very sacred thing that's been handed down to us, which is freedom. And, and, and this, this has been inherited by us. And, and a lot of people don't realize how rare this is. And of course, you and your listeners would, but uh, many people don't. And that's why I think right now is a, a really important time, especially at Christmas when everyone is collecting their family together and, and discussing things around the, the Christmas table to bring up the topic of CBDCs and actually discuss why they are uh, such an um, abhorrent thing because they're just rolling out saying, oh, we've got this new thing called the CBDC and we're, we're just going to do it. Um, and people go, oh, it's an upgrade to the banking system. Cool. You know, they don't really even question it. They're just letting it happen. So that's that's why, you know, I wanted to get on here with you and discuss discuss that well tell me more i'll pretend i'm aunt nilly or whoever and <laughs> don't even know what cbdc stands for so tell me more what do i have to fear i mean the, i trust the banks now uh yeah. josh well why won't i trust them in the future it's going to be more modern isn't it so mm. carry on because this well, is where well, it gets interesting 
<laughs> well, the last two years we've seen what fear does. Um, whether whether you're uh, full on into the COVID thing or you 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 you're skeptical, it doesn't matter. What we can do is step back and say, "Wow, everybody became a hypochondriac, and everybody." was willing to give up their freedoms and step really close to tyranny, really close to ultimate control of movement, of spending. You weren't allowed to buy certain things. They coroned, uh, coroned off certain, certain things that you just couldn't buy. Um, you weren't allowed to move a kilometer outside of your radius. So if you have instant settlement at the central bank that's with programmable money, they have an eye on every single transaction down to the millicent, not even the cent, because then you can also have microtransactions. But what what can they do there? Now, if they have another lockdown, now you can use any excuse. You can say, We're, we have a climate crisis, and um, for the next day, uh, just for fun, no one's allowed to move, just to see. And uh, you're not allowed to spend your currency outside of a kilometer radius of your, your house. And this is very easy to program. Uh, you would be, uh, you could just program that into the money. So if you went outside of that radius and tried to spend the money, uh, it just wouldn't work. It would just go blip, blip, and give you a little red cross on your phone. Now, this is your savings. Money is your work put into, uh, or, or savings put into some sort of store of value, and you're now not allowed to move that. You know, you're being dictated on what you're allowed to do. Now, lockdowns is only the first. Hey, we've now got an obesity uh, epidemic. Um, you've, you've had your sugar intake for the month. Um, we deem that, it's, uh, that you shouldn't be able to buy that, that Mars bar now. And so when you, when you go to the shop and try to buy that Mars bar, no, you, your calorie intake's already been you know, this is this is the micro control that it could lead to, and uh, and and when when they say like, oh, that we've got global warming, this problem. Oh, look, you've already used your fuel for the month. Uh, your oil, uh, your carbon footprint is already over the top. Um, uh, you cannot buy another liter of uh, or another gallon of oil of gas. So the, the these sort of micro controls is where it just starts. We're already, they're already talking in Peru and not only talking, they've programmed it already and testing it where you have a shelf life on your, on your savings. So if let's say there's a, there's a financial crisis like there was in 2008. Oh, we need to move the money. We need liquidity to have velocity uh, because all these savers are destroying the economy. Don't you know? Right. <laughs> and, and, and so what do they do? They say, if you don't move your money within a month, it it ha it it voids and nulls, so it just it just cancels out. So people will start to move, be forced to spend their money. Um, th this is already being tested. This isn't fiction. This is happening in in, in certain places. China's already trying it. Uh, Peru apparently. So we have to be very careful when technologies like Satoshi Nakamoto, what he invented with Bitcoin. Um, was a decentralized was a digital cash that was a that was literally a digital cash the the cash aspect is is important here because you had a bearer based instrument that that a state couldn't get hold of um and what they're doing is bastardizing that concept um and corrupting it into a centralized authority that they have ultimate bondage over that concept ultimate control over every part of your life and and this is something that is that is a wet dream of any major politician that wants to control people and generally folks out there like I, you know there are the rare good politicians ron paul i put in that category um that really just want the best for people but generally speaking if you are a politician you have a little bit of a, a tick going on where you feel that you know how you should live better than you do like that, that they they know how you should live better than you do and and you they want to control a certain aspect by putting laws and controls in place so there's even if they're good things even if they're thinking oh no it's good because there'll be more schools or more hospitals or whatever it is they still feel like they need to assert that control and, and if you get the, a whole bunch of these power freaks 
with this sort of technology, it's a very, very slippery slope. Indeed it is. I think you outlined it well. <clears throat> so earlier on, you said, and I forget the term you used, but like a window or an escape that you could have. So here's my question. It's going to be involved. I'll try to keep it simple. My contention is that <clears throat> they're not going to do away with some of the major cryptos. They will be side by side with the Fed coin. We'll call it that. CBDC, yep. take your pick. However, if you want a mortgage, you want a car loan, a student loan, utilities, trash service, anything that you basically have to have to live, you yeah, must yeah. use the CBDC. You cannot use an alternative. So you couldn't use Bitcoin to pay to sign up for a utility. You couldn't use it to get a student loan. You couldn't use it. So how do we escape or what kind of escape mechanism do we have? And first of all, I, I'm not presuming you agree with me, but I've definitely thought this through and that's the way I see it. It's like, oh no, we don't have anything against these alternatives, except you can't use them, except where we say you can use them. So I could buy a car from you with Bitcoin or I could, you know, do a service exchange, you know, do some research for me or vice versa. And that'd yeah. be fine. And I don't think the government would care other than they want to track it. But uh, so tell me your thoughts on that, because this is what concerns me the most. I mean, I'm for alternative currencies. Everyone thinks I'm like silver only. And certainly that's been a lot of my life. And I certainly still believe it's one of the de facto ways out of this matrix. <clears throat> that's about the most decentralized uh, money I've, you know, for thousands of years. But I want to talk too much. So how do we escape? Is there a way that we can get our utilities hooked up without... Uh, the CBDC in the future? Or first of all, is my premise correct? What do you think? I, I think your premise is correct, um, that they will just enforce it. They'll just say, and we're, we're, I've, I've come back to Australia, I live in, in Europe, but um, I've come back to Australia for Christmas and I see it straight away. The health card, if you want to get a health, uh, the Medicare card over here, um, you, you have to download the app and you, you have to, you know, register everything and it's, and it's all digital now. So it, it's, it's heading that way. It will head that way. The only thing we can do is start at least the minimal we can do is start the conversations around the dinner table, start telling each other uh, what is going on, start telling your family, because if you look at historically through, through communist um, uh, regimes, the first, the first step is to destroy the family network mm -hmm. uh, and the church networks um, to to make to make the state the church, and uh, uh, that everybody worships the state. And so, by 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 looking at that and saying, okay, well, let's do the opposite. Let's really tighten the family network and and talk to each other and have pushback against this stuff before it gets started. Once this gets started, it's going to be orders of magnitude harder to dismantle mm -hmm. so right now is the time to speak up against it and and make it a talking point in the media you know um while i think a lot of the talking points that the right are bringing up are important uh, this is i fear one of the most important ones and it's not being talked about at all um on the left or the right, whatever aisle you speak on, most most people in the private money sector are on the right. But it's 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 super important that we now go into our churches, go into our uh, around our family, and talk about this. Because if you're a, if you're a, a, a God fearing man or woman, um, this has got to be really scary. Because uh, you know we we we've, we've seen this warned about in multiple different holy books not just the christian bible um that this mark of the beast type type of thing where you cannot buy and sell if you don't have this thing now this is exactly what it is yeah it might not be a big stamp on your forehead uh it, it could be just a wallet on your phone uh, it doesn't need to be nanobots in your blood it doesn't need to be some of this hardcore conspiracy stuff it's literally you if you don't have this app, you don't get to do anything. Um, and we are so close to this. It's not even funny. Yeah, another comment. <clears throat> I've been, uh, I do research uh, on the end times financial system for a 
network called David Havner TV. I met him at the Red Pill years ago and uh, asked me if I would want to do it. I said, sure. And so I'm not an expert on biblical studies, or, but I am pretty involved in you know, monetary history. Mm. And so I, my, my take on the Mark of the Beast for, for our audience is it's a system. It's the system. So you can enter the system with a tattoo, with a phone, maybe with a jab. I don't know. But I think it's that you, would, you are aligned with the system. I don't think you have to have a particular thing in your right hand or in your forehead because you can use those as a metaphor for you. most people right hand and you pay with your right hand. Or you think of your digital ID. You know, it doesn't have to literally be. I look at that more as a metaphor. So my take mm -hmm. up until now, and I could change it with more data, is that it is a system that can be entered in a multitude of ways. But once you're connected to the B system, that's it. And as you said, just to reiterate and emphasize that without that linkage, you're not going to be able to get the basics even. And yeah. I have to go one step further because it occurred to me a couple of days ago. Uh, again, not a Bible scholar, but I believe it says that um, a day's wages for like a you know couple cups of barley or something like that. In other words, food is so expensive that you have to have a day's wages basically to eat. Is the way I understand the way it's written in the in the Bible. So you know we are seeing this food crisis, and I don't want to get off topic. So. Um, let's press on. What do you think, besides talking to the family, getting one aware of this? I mean, it comes down to when people get hungry, they'll do almost anything. So what's the conversation around how we can prepare until we have to make that decision? So when we have that point of demarcation, we're prepared. We say, you know, no, thank you. How do we get there? Yeah, well, I mean, this this the amazing thing about the so, so how I see it rolling out is that they will incentivize you almost to jump into this thing. They'll say, okay, convert your bank account to the CBDC and uh, we'll give you an extra 300 bucks or something like that. And everyone goes, oh, wow, 300 free bucks, cool. Or whatever it is, some sort of nominal amount. And, um, and, and now you'll be in the fantastic new and they'll show images of beautiful women and all the typical stuff that Coca-Cola have used to sell their product for years, you know, and, and, and everyone will be like, why, why wouldn't you want that? It's instant sale. It's really quick. It's beautiful. And um, the, the, I think really we have a global system. So, so first it'll be na nations and the beautiful thing about the globe right now there is a state of anarchy in the financial systems in terms of uh, different countries have to still negotiate with each other there's a, there's a free market between the fx you know the fx market so um what what i see will happen first you'll have nations uh the us europe uh australia or um, the uk all starting to build these digital uh, digital id slash cbdc systems and then, hey, there's not instant settlement between the US and the UK. Um, let's have a centralized sure. central system. Yeah. So first it centralizes all, gets rid of all, this, all the retail banks into the central banks, and then the central banks will remove them and just have an uber central bank for the globe. Maybe the Bank of Inter International Settlements would be a, a good pick. So... So th this is the this is the sort of the path that will be taken, and the important thing really right now, and why I'm so grateful for Satoshi of of inventing or putting the right pieces together right at the time that he did or she, is that that it's now that we have this exit door. We have this ability. Yes, there will be products that you won't be able to use or take, and maybe they'll force you. Um, and when you get sick, you pretty much do anything, right? But uh, so so you will go into their system to pay for the doctors that you can only pay for with the CBDC. But up until that point, especially if you're young, learn how to be more self-sufficient, learn how to say no uh, and not bow down. And, and sadly, David, I, I do believe that, I do believe that really it's about re how we rear our kids how the next generation is reared because 
we need, and this is kind of off topic, but it's but it's on topic as well, is that children need to need to be reared not through authority, not like, hey, why is this? Because I told you so. Because all that happens when you teach kids like that through authority rather than uh, logic and reason is that they just bow down to anything. They go from you to the school to the, to the system um, rather than when you teach a child to reason, hey, don't do that. Why? Well, because, and, and you, you talk through it now, it doesn't work every time. You have to, you know, I'm not saying there's a panacea there, but it, really teaching the kids not to just just accept anything because there's an authority figure telling you. And that that's that's a multi-generational thing. And the sad thing is right now we're up against the wall. We're up against this system that is at the doorstep right now. <laughs> so we don't have time for that. And uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of rambling. It's a stream of consciousness here um you know but i i do see it very dire and but i do also see that there is a, a glimmer of light because we do have open blockchains that have the same thing they have fairly instant settlement they have global reach they have the ability not to not to interact with the state or a bank that you have an, a, a, a total independent system generally is you know that's a scale it's a scale there's nothing like super decentralized and not decent it's there's a gray scale in between and and i think um really learning about these and not rejecting them um uh, is is important even you know i know a lot of people in the gold bug they refuse to look at bitcoin and crypto because they they don't understand that there is such thing as a rare number um but these are rare numbers just like gold and silver are rare metals we have the ability to mine these rare numbers and have them as a digital thing that isn't that is a bearer based asset and that's 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 a big step forward well let's learn more about the standard io and i do want to invite you back i think i don't know the right time maybe six months out so much is happening so rapidly but we might need to tune this conversation up a bit as uh this digital id gets pressed forward to more and more countries um, but tell me about the standard I.O., if you will, please. Yeah, I mean, the, the standard really came out of the, the me watching a whole bunch of stable coins be absolute clowns um, and try to back um, some, a, a coin with fluff, try to back it with, with an algorithm, with math. And um, while, while that's a good idea, it, it just is, a, is ineffective. Now, what is effective? What's effective, and we've seen it over 5,000 years, is having gold or silver rare assets backing a, a, a digital asset. Uh, sorry, not a digital, backing a, a certificate, a piece of paper. Now, the problem in the past is that the people that are holding that gold and silver can rehypothecate, can, can write more certificates than they have gold or silver sitting there. And this is the oldest scam in the book. Yeah. Uh, it, it's how it's how all the major major bankers got super wealthy and had more value than any king or queen because they could just print money and um and, and so we wanted to i wanted to look at how do you how do you have a system where you could back a a, a one one token that is pegged to a fiat um uh, with with rare assets so we could create our own gold standard um, we don't have to beg the government for one. So, so what what the standard really is is the ability for people to. Let, I'm going to start off with with Bitcoin and, and Ethereum, but it can also be used for tokenized silver, like what what you guys are doing over on um, uh, as well, and and um, uh, on Load it, is that you could send these. The, let's say Ethereum. Let's say you have a thousand dollars worth of Ethereum into a smart contract. If you imagine that, uh, for those listeners that don't know what a smart contract is, it's basically a computer program um, that runs on a network of computers. So the problem with a computer program is that if you get a virus into that single computer, uh, when you're dealing with money, you, you cannot trust a single computer because it could have a virus, it could be hacked. So the output, you send the money in and you say, don't send that money out unless it's a Tuesday and a blue sky, let's say. Give it some sort of 
set of parameters. Um, well, you don't know if a hacker's gone, well, it's Wednesday, mohoho, and, and the computer you know, releases the funds. What a smart contract is, is a computer program that runs on thousands of computers around the world, and all of them need to have the same output. Well, 50, over 50% 50 of them need to have the same output. And then you can assume that a hacker couldn't have hacked every single computer around the world because it's almost impossible to hack just two, uh, let alone thousands. So, so this is what a smart contract is. Now, um, what, what we've built at the standard, what we're building, is the ability for people to send Ethereum into a smart contract that you control. You have the private key. Think of it as a vault, a, a digital vault or a digital safe. And you send Ethereum in, let's say a thousand bucks worth of Ethereum, and you lock it with it, with your digital key. And you have the key. No one else, no government, no state, no company, no nothing. You have that key. And now that safe is, is a smart safe because you can take, you can mint um, up to 85% of that value that's locked in that safe as a stable coin um, uh, that's pegged to the US dollar. Now, now that you've got that, you can go and buy a car and you haven't sold your underlying assets. And this coin is now backed by a rare thing. So you've got this, you've got this do dollar. Now, the good thing is you don't get tax capital gains because you've effectively borrowed money from yourself. <laughs> you've taken something that you hold. You don't want to sell your Ethereum because it, it might be going up or, or tokenized silver. You don't want to sell your silver. So you could put it in this smart safe generate a, a fiat pegged stablecoin and go, okay, now I've got dollars, um, or, or let's say S dollar, we're calling it standard dollar. And, um, and you can now, you know, buy a car or whatever it is. And all you have to do to unlock the value that's in that smart pay safe is pay it back. Now this loan is at 0% interest because there's no need for interest. We don't, there's no bank or third parties. You've borrowed money from yourself. So you haven't got hit with capital gains. Plus you've borrowed at zero interest. Now, how have the rich always managed to do well during inflation? Well, I'm sure your listeners know, but what they've done is they've borrowed at fixed interest during inflationary times. They've actually utilized the system, which is effectively going short the, the, the thing that you're borrowing because you're... So let's say, let's say you borrow, let's say you know you're a rich, uh, uber rich person and you go to the bank and you say, right, um, I've got a property here. I'm going to uh, leverage it and borrow it. Uh, now, because I'm so wealthy, I can go to the bank and have my terms filled. I can say, I want fixed interest and I don't want to be reevaluated. I don't want my debt to be reevaluated if, if it goes to, z if the currency goes to zero. And they go, ah, yeah, okay, sir. Here you go. The normal person can't do that because they'll just kick you out and say, no. Nah, <laughs> but I, I, I'm super wealthy, so I can do that. And, and what happens, so let's say you buy millions of dollars worth of property and in 10 years time, a million dollars buys you a carton of milk, you've effectively bought that property for a carton of milk. So with the standard, what we're hoping is that people will be able to borrow money from themselves by locking up real assets, rare assets, either tokenized silver or gold or Ethereum and Bitcoin, issue themselves debt at 0% fixed interest that, that absolutely cannot be reevaluated um, because it's a pegged asset. And, uh, and so inflation is effectively paying off their debt as well. And, uh, and there's all sorts of things with liquidation that we can talk about at some other time. But uh, effectively, what we're trying to do is build the ultimate decentralized stablecoin protocol that is fully overly collateralized and programmatically transparent. No human, it doesn't matter how many guns you point at two plus two, it equals four. There's no amount of violence or, or, or threats or government or pressure that you can put on mathematics. It's just a mathematical program and it's running. And so this is really the, the thing that we, this is the way I'm projecting a, a solution against CBDCs or at least a competition because competition keeps the bastards on us to excuse my French or my Australian sure. there. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. So but, I have uh, one more question <clears throat> and that is, so I buy my, thousand dollars it's in the safe i've got the key i get the uh, loan to value of 85 percent. what happens if the uh ethereum goes down by 50 percent? am i going to get a margin call how do i make good on it now 
Yeah, so the margin call is program programmed into that because the whole point of the system is that there always has to be more collateral locked in the system than there are coins, uh, stable coins floating around. It's really important that there's more value than there is uh, fiat effectively floating around. Now, this is what makes it different to any actual fiat. Right. Now, what happens is you have you have multiple choices. One choice is to add more collateral to the smart vault. You know, try to stay over collateralized. Now, if you've lost your job or and, and you just don't have the money at the moment or whatever, and you've got this loan there, what you can actually do if it's going down in price, uh, Ethereum, you can trade the collateral within the smart vault into a tokenized silver so that silver might not be tanking as fast as uh, as fast as Ethereum because it's, it's fairly stable compared to <laughs> Ethereum or Bitcoin. Uh, and so that's that's another way to protect uh, your assets and not be liquidated and the third way is that you can um you can actually well you can actually pay back your loan you know but again if you don't have the money to pay back your loan what we're building into the system is the ability to sell your debt as as a non-fungible token as an nft now a lot of people they say our oh, nfts are pictures of monkeys and funny art yeah, right. uh, but actually NFTs, the technology has been around since since the very early days of Bitcoin. Um, it was one of the first technologies uh, that people built called colored coins, where you would color in one Bitcoin and you could follow it around the network, meaning it becomes non-fungible. And, um, and so the co colored coins or NFTs can be used in the decentralized finance space as well. So imagine if you have a debt and you could sell that debt and anyone holding a certain NFT could unlock unlock the asset so you can sell your debt on to somebody else uh so you at least get a little bit of money back they could then pay off that debt and take the collateral out that, that, that that's in there so there's multiple ways that we're building to have a true decentralized system that's over collateralized overly backed and utilizes amazing uh systems like um uh, that you guys are, uh, are building over there but also um pax gold um uh, Voltoro, where where I uh, one of the exchanges that I started with, that was a Bitcoin physical. It was the first Bitcoin physical gold exchange launched in 2015. They're they're also doing a tokenizing of of precious metals. So, um, and it's important that multiple companies around the world tokenize precious metals. So we don't just have a centralized unit because right. precious metals are the original decentralized money, and we need to marry those two. The precious metals people and the bitcoin people crypto people need to stop fighting the, yeah. real, the real enemy is fiat yeah we need to stop you know <clears throat> bashing our heads it's not bitcoin versus gold it's bitcoin and gold versus fiat that's that's the real fight so where do we find out more just go to the standard.io go to the standard.io currently we're doing um uh, we're releasing the the MVP, the minimal viable product for the. We're, we're launching with S Euro first. The thing with the standard is a lot of these stable coins are just US backed. Uh, what we'll be doing, uh, US pegged, sorry. Uh, what we'll be doing is releasing a stable coin for every major fiat around the world. So we're we'll starting off with euros, then uh, dollars. It'll be uh, uh, Indian rupee, shekel, ruble, Aussie dollar, British pound. And we'll be going through all of the major ones next. But the first one is euro. So you can buy actually the first euro under spot. So it'll be, um, and that's how we're building this liquidity pool, the stability pool, first of all, um, to build the system. So you can do that right now over at the standard.io um, if you're interested. It's definitely not financial advice. Um, you know, it's just, an, uh, it is an experiment. You have to realize that. Uh, these are, anything in crypto is an experiment. It's, uh, uh, but, I, um, you know, I come at it with, I try to look at fun, foundational economic theory. And, and that's why we have people like Patrick Friedman on board, the, the grandson of Milton. Um, and, and because, you know, these, we, we need proper economic theory behind what we're building, because as we've seen with something like Terra Luna, you get these clowns coming in and, um, and you're building these, these technologies that look amazing and also very dangerous. And anything with te economic theory is dangerous. You know, look at Karl Marx. He, he, he. I don't know his intent, but I'm pretty sure he wasn't sort of some malice dude who wanted. He, you know, in his heart, maybe he wanted to help the workers. I don't know. Really? And, but, but 
what happens is that it's really dangerous if you've come up with something terrible like he did. Um, so, so it's important when when we think about economic theories to look at what has worked in the past. And what's worked in the past is that there's a gold reserve or a precious uh, numbers or medals. You know, in the past, it's medals reserve that that issues certificates. And let's find out what the issues with that were and fix those issues. And that's what we're trying to do at the standard. Great. Enjoy it every minute. Thank you so much. I'm sure that we will um, reconvene at a later date. And until then, uh, have a great, happy, happy holiday. And uh, I hope you can escape from Aussie land and get back to Europe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's see. It's a, it is a, you know, I, you know, I dare I say it. It's becoming a prison planet. Um, <laughs> it really is. Alex Jones picked the right name all those years ago because that, that's amazing. Well, Info Wars and Prison Planet. He's pretty accurate. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. So, but uh, but yeah, of course we 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 try to we try to keep it real. <laughs> right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for having me, David.